Our next speaker is Susan Carnell. Dr. Carnell is an associate professor in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she heads the Appetite Lab. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to get to talk at this interesting meeting today. I have no disclosures. Um, despite what a lot of people think when they learn what I study, my background is actually not in nutrition. Um, I'm an experimental psychologist who studies eating behavior, uh, pre predominantly in children, but also in adults. And um, my primary uh, interest is in the uh, field of obesity. And what I'd like to do today is try and build on uh, what some of the earlier speakers have already uh, talked about and to, uh, to ask um, how research on eating behavior, taking more of a psychological perspective, might be able to help us move beyond the kind of more narrow definition of precision, precision nutrition as uh, the search for uh, the optimal diet for an individual uh, and how physiological information might help us determine that, to talk about how um, uh, psychosocial information information and behavioral information might help us determine the best achievable diet for an individual and the best ways to support an individual to achieve it. So we've already uh, seen the biopsychosocial model uh, at this meeting, and I'm going to uh, refer to it again here. I'm not going to talk about all the various factors which may be relevant, uh, but I'm going to focus on eating behaviors and the psychological component here. Oops. Excuse me. Um, so I'll talk about some different types of eating behavior. I'll also talk about their relative prevalence in the population and their relationships with diet. Then I'll talk about um, some studies looking at relationships between eating behavior and food environment and relationships with intervention outcomes. As you'll see, there's not that many studies in this arena, which I think does represent the research gap. I won't talk too much about genetics. You've heard about that a little so uh, in the talk so far, but I will uh, talk a little bit about how they might, um, genetic factors might influence eating behavior because I think it's relevant to the discussion today. And we've also talked about um, uh, the importance of um, income inequities in terms of obesity and eating behavior. I won't talk so much about those systemic factors, but I will talk about uh, the, the potential influence of factors associated with socioeconomic status, such as food insecurity and stress on eating behavior. And finally, I'll try and pull this all together a little bit and talk about possible implications for diet, um, uh, also some perhaps non-diet related implications of the research and some behavioral strategies that are being used to tackle um, eating behaviors in uh, this field. So first, eating behaviors. And um, I wanna start by defining this term appetitive characteristics, which is what I study a lot in my lab. So what do I mean by that term? Um, I mean, early emerging, enduring dispositions towards food or eating styles that differ between individuals. So one example might be food cue responsiveness uh, or how responsive one is to external food cues, um, such as the sight of food or the smell of food, how much does seeing a, um, a delicious food or smelling a delicious food tempt us to want to consume it. Um, another is satiety responsive, uh, responsiveness. So how sensitive are we to internal cues uh, that tell us to stop eating, um, such as the release of gut hormones or um, gastric distension? We have various behavioral tests to measure this, but we also have questionnaires, which I think might be more useful in the context of developing personalized nutrition plans. Um, and uh, one commonly used instrument in the field is the child eating behavior questionnaire. This is a parent report measure. And as you can see, um, it measures various, um, uh, oops, excuse me. It measures various scales tapping food approach traits. So these include food responsiveness. For example, my child's always asking for food. Um, enjoyment of food, for example, my child enjoys eating. Uh, desire to drink, for example, if given uh, the chance, my child would always be having a drink. And emotional overeating, my child eats more when anxious. And it also contains uh, more food avoidant traits. So uh, things like satiety responsiveness, for example, my child gets full easily, slowness in eating, my child eats slowly, uh, food fussiness, uh, my child is difficult to please with meals, and emotional undereating, for example, my child eats less uh, when uh, he or she is upset. <laughs> 
We also have ways of measuring this um, even as early as infancy. So this questionnaire actually um, assesses the same traits during the milk feeding stage where uh, children are just consuming uh, milk alone. And more recently, my colleagues at UCL have developed the adult eating behavior questionnaire with the goal of being able to investigate how these uh, traits change um, and develop over time. So how frequent are these uh, behaviors in the population? Uh, I just want to show you some data from um, a community survey we uh, conducted actually at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And what you can see on the top is um, the distribution of scores in satiety responsiveness based on the child eating behavior questionnaire and um, also scores in the sample of adults um, on the adult eating behavior questionnaire. And what you can see is that the distribution is kind of shifted to the left in the adults. So actually it does seem just based on this um, quick analysis that satiety responsiveness actually decreases in adults compared to children, is lower in adults compared to children. The opposite seems to be true for food responsiveness and emotional overeating, which uh, are actually a little higher in adults. Just move some windows here. Okay. Um, uh, so what about relationships with diet? How do these things actually predict um, what individuals consume? Well, before I talk about that, I actually want to talk about what we know a lot about, which is relationships with weight and adiposity, which, of course, um, is uh, in a large, to a large extent the cumulative result of dietary choices. So in this very large uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of data from over 36,000 children, we saw rather robust positive um, associations with adiposity for the food approach traits and negative associations for the food avoidance traits. And this was also true in the smaller number of prospective studies, both for the CBQ and also for the um, baby uh, eating behavior questionnaire. There's less data using the AEBQ right now, but it seems to follow a, a similar pattern. Um, so what about relationships with diet, actually kind of explicit um, studies about the relationships with diet? Well, an interesting story seems to be evolving here. So uh, we know that satiety responsiveness is associated with lower weight. We also know that uh, consumption of lower energy dense foods um, is associated with lower weight. But actually, when we directly assess the relationship between satiety responsiveness and diet, we actually see a somewhat uh, different picture. Uh, so actually higher satiety responsiveness seems to be associated with things like lower fruit and vegetable liking, less fruit and vegetable um, intake as a percentage of overall intake and less dietary variety and actually higher eating frequency. So perhaps more of a snacking pattern. And this seems to be uh, being borne out in the um, ABQ data as well. So I think what this points towards is that we probably need to be considering both appetite, but also food preferences and habits uh, when uh, thinking about personalized nutrition. Now, one question I'm very interested in in my lab is this question of where do repetitive characteristics come from? And I do want to talk about uh, the potential for genetic influences uh, as it's relevant to our discussion today. So what I'm showing you here is data from a twin study where we actually assessed satiety, responsiveness and enjoyment of food in uh, uh, young twins. And what you're looking at here in the dark blue bars is correlations within monozygotic or identical twins who share all their genes compared to correlations with uh, within dizygotic twins who share only half their genes. And what you can instantly see is that the correlations within the monozygotic twins are much uh, higher. And actually, uh, uh, you can calculate heritability from this data. And we see that 63% of the variation in satiety responsiveness and 75% of the variation in enjoyment of food are attributable to genetics based on this method. Interestingly, emotional overeating and undereating seem to show more environmental um, influence. We can also demonstrate heritability even when we uh, measure appetite in infancy. So what you can see here is that slowness in eating and satiety responsiveness are really quite substantially genetically influenced and enjoyment of food and food responsiveness also show significant genetic influence. So I think the implications here is that these behaviours really do seem to emerge early and the fact that they are genetically determined to some extent suggests they may be quite difficult to change and we may need to work with them rather than against them. I do just want to talk about um, another example of eating behavior. So some of you are probably familiar with the concept of uh, binge eating, which is actually a um, disorder, uh, uh, has, is classified as a um, disorder in the DSM-5. 
so just to kind of review the definition here, what binge eating disorder constitutes is uh, recurrent and persistent binge eating episodes in the absence of compensatory behaviors and accompanied by marked distress. Um, binge eating episode being consumption of a very large amount of food in a small space of time. It's often um, binge episodes can be triggered by stress and anxiety and um, happen when an individual is kind of alone uh, uh, in the evening at the end of the day. And it's actually quite uh, common. So there's a 2.8% lifetime prevalence in the US. Of course, uh, you may not qualify as, um, uh, uh, as exhibiting full binge eating disorder, but you still may have kind of binge eating present. Um, so you could have sub-threshold binge eating disorder, binge eating, the occurrence of binge eating, or loss of control eating, which is how this is defined in children and adolescents. So what loss of control eating is, is the subjective experience of loss of control while eating, actually irrespective of the reported amount of food consumed. And actually about a third of uh, children with, and adolescents with overweight or obesity experience some loss of control eating. And uh, binge eating episodes are of course associated with consumption of high energy dense, um, high sugar, high fat um, foods. Um, I also wanted to point out that I'm talking about a certain number of dimensions of eating, but you'll see a lot um, of other ways of describing this kind of eating in the literature. And some of them are um, listed at the bottom of the diagram here. Um, However, uh, they all, um, even though they may be, um, they're slightly different and they may be um, more intuitive for certain populations, um, they all seem to be getting an, under, um, an underlying latent trait of uncontrolled eating, which is exhibited to varying degrees. And this uh, phenomenon of uncontrolled eating is, of course, related to other more general behavioral traits, uh, which are listed here. So reward sensitivity, uh, um, cognitive controllability and negative affects may all contribute to the expression of uncontrolled eating in an individual, which may lead to overeating, typically of high energy dense um, palatable foods and to obesity. I just wanted to mention those other um, potential uh, measures of eating behavior and the underlying construct. So now I want to, uh, to go on to talk about relationships with food environment and intervention outcomes, which I think is highly relevant to the, um, uh, the goal of personalized nutrition. And there's really not that many studies looking at this, but here was a nice one conducted in children relatively recently, which suggests that children's appetitive characteristics might actually affect how individuals respond to the food environment, in this case, at variable portion sizes. So this was a study in 100 children, and they were um, exposed to four different dinner conditions where the portion size size varied between 100% um, of the recommended amount to 150%, 200%, 200%, and 250%. And what you can see is that individuals who had high satiety responsiveness were actually relatively unaffected by the portion size condition. But those who had low satiety responsiveness actually um, consumed more um, in that, those large portion conditions. So they seem to be most vulnerable to the effect of large portion sizes on increasing intake. Here's another interesting example, this, uh, in this case, um, in the context of behavioral obesity treatment. So um, in this study, children with overweight or obesity underwent family-based behavioral weight loss treatment. And what you can see is that those who had high satiety responsiveness actually were showing good weight loss outcomes, even by 18 month follow-up. But those with high food responsiveness or high emotional eating were actually showing greater weight regain. So what this suggests is that child's appetite may actually affect um, intervention outcomes. So children with high food responsiveness and emotional eating may actually find it harder to maintain dietary changes. And I want to finish this section also by mentioning some data in adults. So we talked about binge eating. This is data from the Look Ahead trial, which was an RCT of an intensive lifestyle intervention um, uh, for individuals with diabetes. And what you can see here is four year weight loss outcomes. And you can see that the group which actually showed least weight loss at four years uh, was the group who um, displayed consistent binge eating. So this also seems to be a, um, a behavioral um, phenotype which is affecting um, the outcome of interventions. So um, I think what this means is that we may need to take into account um, uh, uh, when designing personalized nutrition interventions, people's um, eating behaviors, which might affect how they respond to certain recommendations. I want to finish uh, by talking about um, the potential influence of socioeconomic status, as I've uh, mentioned earlier. 
And I want to, um, in this section, also introduce two kind of different ways of uh, looking at eating behavior. So some of you may be familiar with the concept of delay discounting. Uh, what this is, is the degree to which an individual is inclined to pick a reward, which could be food or non-food, uh, which is smaller but delivered sooner, as opposed to a reward which is larger but delivered later. And the classic example of this is the marshmallow test, which is um, pictured here. What they did in this particular study is to look at food related um, delay discounting. So the food here was a, the reward here was a food reward. And what they found was that women who were um, who had food insecurity were actually more likely to opt for those smaller sooner food rewards. So this is pretty interesting because it suggests that this environmental factor of food insecurity might actually be um, affecting habitual decision making in relation to food. Another um, way also derived from behavioral economics that we can think about um, eating behavior is to assess the reinforcing value of food. So what this is, is the motivation to obtain food or how hard or how long someone will work to obtain food. And what we did in this particular study was to see how that associated with um, psychosocial stress. So this was our survey conducted um, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. We actually assessed COVID pandemic associated stress levels and an individual's willingness to work just by uh, doing finger taps for a hypothetical delivery of a portion of a preferred food from various food categories. And what we found was that motivation for sweet snacks, uh, for actually fruit also and fast foods was greater than motivation for savory snacks and vegetables. And actually higher COVID related stress was associated with greater food motivation across all the categories. Uh, so this food related decision making process may also be important to consider in context of how people are able to um, uh, adopt precision nutrition recommendations. So I want to finish by just uh, bringing together some ideas uh, for the implications of this um, eating behavior research for personalized nutrition. And first, I want to talk about diet or food environment. Um, so perhaps it might be the case that if someone is relatively low in satiety responsiveness, they might not do so well on kind of family style eating or buffet type situations and portion control may be something that's more recommended for them. Uh, certain foods may also be um, more beneficial. For example, uh, we know that protein is more satiating calorie for calorie and then fruits and vegetables um, can help uh, um, in terms of increasing volume within creating, creating the sensation of fullness. We also know that high satiety responsiveness might be associated with this snacking pattern. So providing kind of nutrient dense snacks might be more important for that person. For someone with high food responsiveness, control of the dietary environment, choice of restaurant, for example, might be more important. Those with binge eating or stress eating patterns may benefit more from uh, keeping a kind of healthy home food environment to reduce temptation there or attempts to reduce stresses and find alternative coping strategies. I also just wanted to point you towards this interesting work by Kerry Boutel, which is actually trying to directly tackle food responsiveness and cue responsiveness with a treatment that involves appetite awareness training and cue exposure treatment for food. So I'll just leave you with this uh, summary and some remaining questions. Um, I think I've uh, hopefully shown you that appetitive characteristics, which do show genetic influence, uh, influence diet and weight in children, we need to understand more, I think, about how they develop through the life course. They may influence the effect of food environment factors and interventions on diet and weight. So I think we need to consider individual differences more actually in population and intervention research, and perhaps continue, considering an individual's appetitive as well as physiological characteristics might help to increase the impact of personalized nutrition. And I'll finish with um, some acknowledgements of my lab and funding and look forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Cornell, for highlighting the importance of the biopsychological model in considering an individual's appetite. 